Good evening and welcome to our webinar, Grief in Today's Family. My name is Pat Loader and I'm the Executive Director of the Compassionate Friends. Let me just mention before we start that all attendees are muted. To ask a question, you will need to type it into your question area on your screen's control panel. Our presenter tonight is Scott Davis, a bereaved dad, who will be pre presenting grief in to, uh, today's family. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Pat. It's a great opportunity to uh, make this uh, presentation. Uh, this is one that I've uh, presented at uh, national meetings and, and, and other uh, venues. Um, one of the uh, things that about uh, tonight's presentation is that we're going to take a different uh, approach to understanding what's happened to each of us. Uh, the corporate world has spent millions of dollars studying groups and analyzing their actions and identifying best practices. Uh, the family is the basic group of every culture and the research and study applies to each and every one of us. Uh, we're going to talk about some tools and I hope you have a pencil and paper uh, because I hope you will uh, create your own um, uh, tools as we go through this. Um, when I forwarded the slides to uh, Pat, she's, her comment to me was, hmm, these are a little cryptic. Well, there was a purpose behind my uh, design, and that is for you to be able to draw uh, these designs as well and to apply them to your family. Uh, I've spent a lot of my career involved in leadership training with adults and in studying groups. Uh, I find it very fascinating the way people interact and certainly uh, as I considered uh, our situation as bereaved parents and siblings and others, uh, these things apply to us as well. Um, I encourage you to uh, ask questions at any time. Uh, type those in and send those to Pat um, because uh, your contribution um, to this program uh, will be, and all of our experience will be enhanced by uh, the questions that you send in and the responses that we generate. Um, my uh, story is um, like many uh, of us. Um, our uh, son, uh, age 14, um, died in 1988. Um, he um, it was a suicide. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, my wife and I uh, had that experience of being at a college football game. Uh, we heard an announcement come over the loudspeaker. In today's world of cell phones, that doesn't happen anymore, uh, but was asked to call home, and that then began the journey on which we find ourselves all these many years now. Um, as we... Uh, um, worked through and became involved with the local chapter. Uh, we became part of Compassion Friends right away. Uh, it was a very significant part of our life and a part of our grief journey. And I hope tonight's presentation will help each of you. Uh, we'll begin uh, by talking about relationships. And this would be uh, where uh, we look at it in the terms of a mobile. Uh, it's an, a good way to think about a relationship because um, each relationship develops its own balance. Uh, so you have um, a relationship form, um, a marriage um, ensues, and you work out uh, your relationship with each other. Um, then uh, through time, why then a child is born. And as we uh, all know, we got to rebalance ourselves. No longer did we uh, sleep in on uh, Saturday mornings, uh, there was that child to be taken care of, and that caused us to rebalance our lives. Um, then the family grows. Uh, actually, this would be symbolic of my family, and hopefully you'll draw a, um, a mobile like this so that it would be uh, like your family. Uh, so uh, there were a total of three children. Uh, Keith, our son that died, was the middle child. 
Uh, and as each child uh, was born, obviously, uh, we went through this rebalancing process. And also, we go through a process of relationships between the children, their uh, teenagers at this point, and their relationship to um, my wife and I is changing as we grow. Obviously, uh, as we pass through, uh, go through time, uh, obviously, the relationships also between uh, each of the children uh, is different. Uh, the communication flow, um, typically the communication is between the oldest to the middle child and the middle child to the youngest. It's not that often that the youngest is talking to the oldest. I mean, they do interact, but there's more communication between uh, them. Obviously, the parents talk more to the uh, oldest. The oldest has had the opportunity to be in this family the longest. and. Uh, as they will tell you, they get the most uh, attention. Um, then as we move to our circumstance, um, our middle child, as I indicated, Keith, um, died. And so now everything changes. And how do we relate uh, to each other? Um, our world is upside down. Uh, we don't know what to do. How do we define each, ourselves? How do we relate uh, to each other as a result of uh, Keith's death? Uh, just a few days after um, Keith died, our uh, oldest came to me and said, we're going to go on living, aren't we? And that is a very typical comment. Uh, there is a um, this was an article in the Atlantic uh, magazine in May of 08, and this is an Israeli family. And during one of the conflicts in the Middle East, uh, one of the children dies. Uh, the parents uh, tell the sister, and the sister's comments as she cried, and I quote, but we still go on living, right? That comment was exactly the same as the comment Glenn made, and it's, I'm sure as the comment that was made by many of your children as well. Um, the, the whole world in which they live and operate and function has been turned upside down, and they're trying to find uh, some uh, balance. Uh, the problems that begin here, uh, are the ones also of communication. Uh, it's obviously it's communication with between the oldest and the parents, but it's also communication between the youngest and the oldest, because the translator is gone, and we now have an empty space. And that's why I drew it like this, because psychologically we also have an empty space which we as a family have to figure out how to deal with. Uh, we have memories of Keith, uh, and though at the beginning those are obviously very painful, uh, but Keith is still a part of our life, and how do we relate to each other, and how do we adjust our lives to compensate for his loss? One of the things that happens in families uh, is should the oldest be the one that died, then the younger two, in, if assuming that there were three children, uh, the younger two are now faced with a change in position. Uh, I was making a presentation a number of years ago, and uh, a lady came up to me and commented how her second child had come to her in tears, and she was anticipating what the conversation was going to be, and then had the total surprise because her second child said, Mom, I cannot be the oldest, because each of us assumes a different role within the family, a different position, and then whenever one of the siblings dies, that order gets changed, and now, in addition to the grief that's going on because of the death of the, their brother or sister, they're also faced with this pressure that they feel about now I'm in a new position, and that wasn't the one that I have grown up in, and that's not the one that I'm used to. 
So here's part of the, what it looks like when we're trying to seek a new balance. We don't know who we are or where we are, and when you say, I don't know who I am, that's a very true statement. Because the way we define ourselves and understand ourselves is by the relationships that we develop with other people and our roles in those relationships. So as we um, try to sort this out and we work at sorting it out, what we have to do is determine how we're going to uh, relate to each other. And it's a, there's a lot of work involved in all of this. And it takes time. And sometimes it takes a long time. Uh, it took a long time in our case for our oldest and our youngest to uh, work through their issues resulting from Keith no longer being there to be the translator. Uh, that has been worked out, but it took uh, between 10 and 15 years for them really to come to a point where they had good communication uh, because they had a lot to overcome. Now, as a side comment, in a just because of the age difference, uh, you can have similar kinds of issues. For instance, personally, I'm the oldest, and my uh, sister is seven years uh, younger than I am, and there's a brother in between us. Um, I started working at a very uh, young age and was gone. Um, a lot in the summers uh, when I was starting in, at junior high and then certainly in high school. <clears throat> and then when I uh, went to college, why I worked uh, away at the summers and would only be home a week at the beginning of the summer and a week at the end, week when I returned from college and the week as I was getting ready to go to college. Years later, my in a conversation with my sister, she commented to me, I thought you never liked me. And I realized then her situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis me was no different than our daughter versus our son because we are all at such different points in our own development that even in a situation where the death has not occurred, um, misunderstandings arise and people are not there. Development is different. Obviously, when I was a senior in high school, uh, she was... Uh, in the fifth grade. So I didn't have much to say to her and she didn't have much to say to me and then I was gone. So as you can see, it doesn't. this issue isn't just within families in which a death occurs, but it can also occur just as it has occurred in, in my family. Um, so the mobile is a good way for us to think about this, to think about a relationship, and as I indicated earlier, I encourage you to draw your own mobile and chart where you are in your progress to help you understand uh, your relationship with your spouse and also the relationship with uh, surviving children. If there are no surviving children, then you have a big empty space that's hanging out there that you have to work through. How, how do we accommodate this? How do we reconcile ourselves to that? Part of the whole process with understanding how groups work and how groups be behave and interact with each other is the process that's identified as group dynamics. Um, these are some words that have been uh, created to help people understand um, the process of group dynamics. Uh, when a group initially forms, and, and this applies to groups the size of a family, uh, it also applies to groups of a hundred or more. Um, there's actually been research that shows it's much larger, and so this would be, for instance, in your workplace, you've got the same situation, uh, in your church, um, in the classroom at school, uh, where your children are, this is always uh, there in taking place. Um, the group initially comes together and forms. Uh, the white line that's drawn across the graph, um, as I'm highlighting there with uh, the arrow, uh, my mouse pointer, uh, indicates performance of the group. 
so when the group initially forms, everybody's pretty much on their best behavior, and the performance is kind of in the mid-range. But then as the group is together a little while, then they go through a process that's called storming, which means we're trying to work out what our relationships are. How do we relate to each other, and how do we relate to the individual members within the group, but also uh, the uh, group as a whole? How do we understand the group? Uh, the performance, obviously, then declines during the storming period because we can't focus on the job that we're about. We're trying to figure out how we relate to each other. Uh, then we come to the um, section called norming, which means it's just a word that's made up to uh, indicate normalizing of relationships. In other words, we're starting to figure out how we relate to each other and uh, how we then focus on the tasks that uh, are at hand. Uh, then as we progress through time, uh, then we move into the performing stage and then the group performance really takes off. But this process is revisited every time there's a change in the group. So if you think back and look back at the uh, earlier uh, mobiles we talk about here, uh, obviously we went through this when we uh, got married. Uh, we went through that process of figuring out how we were going to relate to each other. Then when the child is born, then we go through the process again. Um, then as additional children are born, we go through the process again. Every time we revisit this, we re-process re, um, um, ourselves in understanding how the group uh, relates to each other. Uh, obviously then when a child dies, we are now, as, as indicated here, our world is upside down and part of our feeling about this when we look at uh, f the forming, storming, uh, norming and performing is that we're thrown back into the storming phase. We're trying to figure out how we relate to each other again. And when you make that statement, I don't know who I am, absolutely you don't know who you are because the group that you're a part of or that you were a part of before no longer exists. And so now you are having to reform uh, yourselves and trying to reach the, some kind of a new balance. This exact same thing happens with your friendships, with your church group, with your work group, with the group that your, your children are a part of uh, in the school. Um, wherever we go, we were all had a position within that group that we were a part of. And the change that occurred because one of our children died changes who we are and as a result throws the group off. And how many of you have had people either signal to you or say to you, um, I want you back the way you were before. Uh, as we all have experienced, we know that the greater culture hopes that after six weeks or six months at the most that, that everything's back to where it was before. But as we know, it never will be because we have an empty space. We have a person that's missing. And we're trying to figure out how to address that. And frankly, we never will be who we were before because now we have a new us, a new relationship. And in the process of developing that new relationship, we change. We become different people. Uh, we have different focus. Uh, and that is unsettling to the people who are in our uh, group, uh, these other groups that we're a part of, because they want us back being who we were before. Another way to think about this and look at it is to think about um, these two lines uh, approaching from the sides are two people traveling through life, you and your spouse. And you're on your life journey. 
uh, you obviously you come from someplace else, and someplace else would mean the families that you uh, came from. As you travel through time, and then you meet each other, uh, and you get married, um, then you go through a process, as we related before, this forming and storming and norming, and the squiggly lines here, moving back and forth, uh, are to represent the dynamics of the relationship. Uh, because as we're trying to sort out how we relate to each other and how we address life, then our relationships are all over the place. It's our interaction in our workspace, our interaction uh, within our faith community. Uh, all of those things come into play and, and, and with our extended family as we go back and forth trying to figure out who we are. I was making this presentation one time, and a lady held up her hand and said, there's something wrong with your picture. And I said, oh, what's that? She said, well, when you're, if you knew my husband and myself, you would have those squiggly lines going all the way to the sides of the graph, um, because our relationship has been all over the place. Well, for some people, it certainly is. Um, then when we look at this kind of an approach and a child is born, the child then is added to and comes as a part of um, this um, relationship represented by the, these lines moving up and back, uh, which are the dynamics of life. Um, so they then become a part of this dynamic, a part of this relationship part, this is their identity, this is who they are. This is not your identity, because your identity is relates back to the family that you came from, the community you came from, but your children, this is their identity, this is where they come from. Then whenever we have a situation where a child dies, everything changes. The two little lines sticking up uh, straight up would be the two children. Certainly in our case, there would have been three of those, would be three of those. And that's where the oldest said, we're going to go on living, aren't we? Because this dynamic, this relationship is the one that he understands that's what he's a part of. And all of a sudden, this is being torn apart because his brother is no longer there. Now, the lines drawn out to the side are out for a little bit of additional uh, emphasis, but one of the things that we know happens is uh, in its imperceptible to us as the surviving parents, but it is absolutely recognized by our children, and that is we move a little bit away. We create a little bit of distance. We create a little psychological space. And why is it that we create that space? We've just had a child die. Can I survive if another one of my children dies? So psychologically, a little bit of space is created. We don't see it. We can't even probably verbalize it. That's what's going on. We just know we have tremendous amount of fear. Uh, if someone doesn't arrive home when they say they're going to, if um, they are not where we expect them to be, uh, bad things happen and we know it and we've experienced it. So we anticipate the worst. And in anticipating the worst, this is the impact it has on us and our children pick up on that and it scares them because what they see is the fabric of the relationship they're a part of is being pulled apart. And it was already damaged very severely when their sibling died, and now they see it being damaged even more and threatened because of the fear that's in place and the whole dynamic that's changed because their sibling is no longer there. But we don't live our lives in isolation. And this is part of understanding why we have differences in our approach to our grief story, differences in our approach to our grief understanding. We use the central um, 
a graph representing the relationship to be the family, this family, the family whose child has died. But these over to the left and over to the right are have different representations. Those are different uh, groups or families that we have come from. So immediately to the right and to the left, that would be the family that the husband comes from and the wife comes from. Well, then when you look behind those, those are the families that your grandparents came from. All of those had different experiences, different uh, views of life, different um, uh, philosophies of life, all of which come and are distilled down and become a part of you. So when we have this thing that typically evolves between spouses of your grief is different than my grief, when you think about it in this perspective, it's no wonder because we each come from a different place. I remember being in Chicago at a national meeting and Darcy Sims having presenting a session about um, grief and the problems of husbands and wives have with relationship to the grief experience that they have and the grief experience of their spouse. Uh, there were a couple of hundred people probably in the room and she has us all stand up and she asks us to look around and say, do you see anybody in here that looks exactly like you? And she said, now don't sit down immediately. You know, if you've been in a session with her, you know how she conducts that. And so uh, after a couple of minutes and looking around, people are talking, all these kind of things, she tells us all to be quiet and sit down. And she said, okay, I want you to hold up your hand if you saw anybody here that looked exactly like you. Of course, there was not a hand that went up. And then in her own way, she blasted us and said, then why do you think your spouse should grieve the way you do? And this is another way to think about that, is that we all bring these different life experiences and those influence who we are, and we all come from a different place. So it's different. It's not wrong. It's always different. So we look at these groups and these off to the side on the right or the left, first of all, thinking about them as the family. But these groups also represent other uh, groups that we're a part of. Uh, the faith community that you came from, the school that you went to, the place where you work. All of those things are, all of those are groups that you interact with as you have gone through life and now those groups have influence on you as you are on your grief journey. Um, we have the problem, and certainly I had this problem in the in the workspace. Uh, I was the guy who uh, provided some humor. Uh, I always had uh, um, a smile on my face and uh, greeted and interacted with everybody. But what happens after my son dies? That's not the case. People don't know how to deal with it, and they don't like it because they want me back the way I was before. Uh, when you are in your um, faith community, sometimes faith communities are supportive and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they want you back the way you were before. Sometimes they are accepting. Sometimes parts of our extended family are accepting and sometimes they aren't. Uh, we have uh, good uh, friends who uh, Unfortunately, it developed uh, in his case that after their daughter died, uh, a part of his family uh, basically became toxic. Uh, he could not uh, deal with them, and that relationship was just kept at a distance. So you have all of these different groups that you interact with, your neighbors, the people in the workplace, the people uh, in the school, um, the, play, the school that your children attended, um, all of these have an influence on how you relate, but also they are an influence on you as you are working on trying to seek a new balance. 
any questions, please uh, send those in to Pat, and uh, we'll uh, visit about them. Uh, would you like to take some questions, Scott? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, I have one from Debbie, and she says, as a single mom losing my son and only child, I am lost. Um, I do not have an identity anymore. I'm no one's mom anymore. How do I fit in? You have uh, uh, my deepest sympathy because you don't have your spiral here uh, created a real created a real problem for you because it just left you being there. Now, one of the things that happens, and it happens to many of us, and it certainly it happened to me, and it's happened to many other people, is that as you are, go along your grief journey, you will have friends appear, people who may have been a casual acquaintance before, but friends that will appear who come in support of you. And what I highly recommend is that you accept their hand of friendship. Accept their desire to be with you and support you. And your situation is um, not unlike a situation of a friend of ours. Uh, she had um, a single mom and uh, two children were killed in a car wreck. Uh, so she was a single parent, and now she was by herself. Uh, and the thing that helped her and sustained her were those people who came uh, out of a heartfelt desire to be in support of her, and she accepted their friendship. And friendship is a challenge in, in today's world because the number of friends that most people have has become a smaller and smaller number. But this is a part of uh, what I would hope would happen for you, Debbie, is that as you identify those people who have uh, come forward, accept their hand of friendship, and explore developing and creating a new family with them. Many of us do this, but not by ourselves. And I really hope you stay in touch with the Compassionate Friends family to help and assist you in this process. Good. Um, here's a question from Constance. Um, we lost our granddaughter at age 16 last summer and are devastated. She suffered terribly for seven months from AML. The grief is still so present and she was our son's only child. We feel so lost without her, but some people think she was just our granddaughter and we should get past it. We do not talk about it except between our son and my husband and myself, as people do not understand. Constance, and for all of us, what's the one legacy that we all have? It's our children or it's our grandchildren. So your grief is very valid, and there's every reason to to embrace it and to walk that journey uh, and try to seek understanding. She was your future legacy and she's not there. And as you indicated, she was your son's uh, only child. So he is having the same feeling that you're having, but he has the different feeling of being uh, the parent. You have the feeling of I'm grieving for my son and his grief, but I'm also grieving for the fact that we don't have our granddaughter anymore, and she is a part of our legacy. So um, your grief is very real, and it, and it is to be validated, absolutely. Um, here's a question from Wendy. Um, how do you handle the death of a child that dies from depression? We try to explain it as a disease, but most people do not look at it that way. There's a great stigma attached. Uh, I understand this very well because our son uh, is a suicide. And fortunately, um, we were with some very good counselors right at the very uh, beginning, right after he died, and 
uh, we had a chance to talk about uh, depression. Um, depression is a many-faceted um, condition, and it is very real, and it um, can uh, really close off life. Uh, it really can, for instance, uh, thinking about it in terms of uh, being in a room with windows and uh, pulling the shades down, things get dark. Um, that's a part of this whole um, experience uh, with depression. Um, the thing also to think about, it doesn't change our grief, it doesn't change the experience that we're in, but to understand on a broader perspective, uh, depression has been, and severe depression has been experienced by a lot of people, and some of those people have written about it and talked about it. Winston Churchill experienced depression throughout his life, and he called it the black dog. Uh, so he, this was something that he struggled with uh, throughout his life, uh, but it can be so overwhelming that people see no hope, and then unfortunately um, they uh, can take some actions that uh, bring their life to an end. So uh, it is very real. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, read uh, more about it. Fortunately, we've had some good research that's come out in the last five to six, seven years with regard to depression. Uh, and I would go on the uh, internet and do uh, a Google search on it and look at uh, some of the research that come from the reputable um, universities and research centers. Uh, I think it can help you understand it. Uh, it doesn't change your grief in any way. And certainly I understand the stigma issue because whenever your child dies um, in this fashion, uh, people think, well, why didn't you intercept it? Why didn't you do something about it? We see these programs that talk about uh, uh, suicide prevention and all of that is well and good. And I'm, I'm saying that I'm not criticizing those. I'm lifting those up because those can certainly have value. But when your child has died in this fashion, um, then people can be critical of you uh, with when they do not understand what's taking place. Good. Um, this question is from Caroline, and she says, I'm a single mother as well. After my son died at three months old, my husband took his own life. I instantly became a grieving mother and a widow. Five years later, I have just adopted a new newborn baby boy. I struggle every day as people keep insisting that I should be happy with my new baby boy. What people don't understand is that this new baby boy does not replace the son that I lost. My adoption journey has been a blessing, but it, but it has also impacted my grief. I would... Um agree with your uh, statement uh, very much that your new child, this adopted child, does not replace the child that died. N none of us can be replaced. Every, every person is unique. I mean, this is a problem that, that women have with miscarriages as well, and people think, well, let's just get over that. Well, at the time of conception, dreams and hopes and aspirations were formed, and that is a unique person. Uh, your child lived three months. You had all of those hopes and dreams and aspirations for that child, and it is very real for you to uh, feel that grief. You have joy because of the adoption, but you also have grief because your other child, the child that died at the age of three, of three months is not there for you to enjoy. Uh, so it is a part of your grief journey. I'm very pleased to hear that you've taken this step, but your grief is very valid and um, do not let anyone take that away from you because that is a part of your experience and who you are. and. Ultimately, it enriches your life, but whenever it's still close term, uh, you, it's a very difficult thing to think that there might be some enrichment that would come from all of this. Okay. Um, this is from Donna, and she said, we have lost two of our three sons as adults. How will that change our relationship with our remaining son? 
the remaining son is 30 years old. In my experience in, in visiting with others, the problem that, come, that can come is one of placing uh, extraordinary expectations on the survivor. Uh, part of this also is the fear that's inherent. Two sons have died. How, what would, uh, how would I survive this? How would I feel if my third son died? So there's uh, a problem with regard to letting them be an adult and live their life, but at the same time you having to live with the fear of uh, what do I do if something uh, tragic happens to him. So it's a real balancing act of encouraging him, uh, and part of the challenge that he may have is one of what's sometimes called survivor guilt, is that his brothers died and he survived. And so he may question why uh, he is alive and his brothers are dead. Mm. Um, this is from Christine. How do you seek a new balance when you do not feel like doing so? Um, that is a journey, uh, and at the beginning, uh, it is difficult. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, placing one foot uh, in front of the other, just living one day at a time. Um, as the, and also, uh, I would encourage you that if you are, I sense that there's some depression involved here, would be to seek out some professional counseling help. Mm -hmm. um, there are, and, and as those who are further along in their grief know, there are good counselors and there are ones who are not. And so you may end up having to uh, interview several of them or visit with other people that you know who uh, are bereaved parents or siblings and ask them for someone uh, who uh, was able to assist them. But I would suggest to you, first of all, it's a day-by-day -day issue, and you will get there because the rest of us have. Part of my wife and my reason for being involved in Compassion and Friends all of these years later, our son died in 1988, was for you to look at us and say, you know, if those two could make it, we can. Uh, so you can make it, but we were helped along the way with professional counseling, and I certainly recommend it. Um, but what you have to do is search out somebody that can help you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Scott, uh, can you please also speak about a dad, mom, two children as a family unit, then dad and oldest child die within six months, and also the feeling that friends and family give you the impression that if they stay close, they will catch what you have, the loss of a child. Well, you have a very complicated grief uh, because you you're, are going through the widow's grief, but then also you're going through the mother's grief, and your spouse is not there to support you and walk this journey with you. Um, the other part of your comment uh, is truly amazing when you think about it, uh, to think that other people would think that our tragedy could, is some kind of a virus that could be caught by them, but it's almost a universal experience among bereaved community is that they have lost relationships because of this. Um, people are fearful of what happened to you. They don't want to think about it, uh, and so part of their way of dealing with that is that they pull back. So when you look kind of at, at what's on the screen right now, one of the things that ends up happening is we end up having to form new relationships. So here we were, and we had these relationships, but now because of the death of our child and people are, who were our friends before are not our friends now. Well, I shouldn't say they're not our friends, but they are fearful of being with us because they don't want to, one, they don't want to think about what they would do if one of their children died, and two, they have this feeling of, if I'm not around you, then I won't think about it. In essence, you know, it's catching. Uh, so 
it really puts us in a situation where we end up having to form new relationships. And unfortunately, that's part of this process of being a bereaved uh, parent or sibling is not only did our child or sibling die, but we have relationships outside of that that we thought would be supportive of us that have died as well. And so we're in the process of developing new relationships to go along with it. So in, in your case, as I mentioned earlier, I would certainly consider some professional counseling to help you with this, but also be open to the fact of and open to the situation and the possibility of forming new relationships with people that are going to be supportive of you. And to recognize one of the things that we all have to recognize is there are some people that we can no longer be around. And they do not add to our life. And if they are not helping me survive, then I have to question why I should be relating to them. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Um, this question um, it starts out, my husband and I have always had the relationship that others were jealous of. We have always been open and honest. After the after the death of our son three years ago, out of respect for one another and a fear of not wanting to up upset each other further, we stopped sharing, first about the grief, then little things around the house because we didn't want to add to the burden the other might already be feeling. This has taken a toll, and as much as we love one another, we now struggle with communication. Do you have any suggestions on how to help us get back to the habit of open communication? A, a couple of uh, observations here. Um, one of the problems that we have in current day culture, and this impacts not only those of us who are bereaved, but it impacts everybody else. The number of friends that people have have significantly diminished, and I, I mentioned this earlier. This can have a very negative impact on our marriages, on our relationship, because whenever we um, have to put all of our need for and desire for communication on our spouse, it may be too much. And as you indicated, out of respect for each other, you uh, stopped communicating. Uh, I would encourage you to try to start communicating. I would also encourage you to seek some professional counseling. But I would also encourage you to, uh, if the possibilities are there, to develop some friendships, both you and your husband develop some friendships that with people that they can you can have some conversation with it will ultimately end up enhancing your relationship because it takes some of the pressure off of it but it, yet at the same time it's a, find somebody that they can visit with and as you develop a friendship over time then conversations can occur that help relieve the uh, need uh, for communication between spouses. It doesn't diminish that relationship. In fact, it can enhance it, and I think it does. But uh, there's an additional need for an outlet. But I would certainly recommend some counseling because obviously you had a great relationship before and you want to recapture that. And so um, I would do everything I could to try to get back to the and, – and remember, first of all, you're not going to get back where you were. Uh, because when you look back at what we talked – talked about before, uh, you know, when we're trying to seek this new balance, um, we're not going to be back where we were before. We're going to create something new and different. Uh, so uh, some adjustment of your expectation is probably going to be involved, but I, that's really a professional counselor that can help you work through that issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, would you like another question or would sure. you like to go sure. on? Okay, this is from Ellen and she said, we lost our apparently healthy son Levi when he was three and a half during a nap. We have no answers as to why he died. This is scary and scary for our daughter. How as parents do I help our, our daughter understand what we don't understand? A uh, very good question uh, about the uh, unknowns of life. Um, one of the challenges that, that we face 
and this has come in a number of different ways, but all of our advancements uh, have gotten us to the point of thinking that we can uh, unwind every knot, uh, answer every question. And there are ones that just cannot be answered and that cannot be um, solved. We cannot get to the bottom of. Uh, and I think it's in some part uh, you and and your husband um, working toward a, a place where you can't understand everything. Uh, you cannot. Some questions cannot be answered. For instance. Uh, with us, uh, our son was a suicide. There were no signals. It was the first attempt, and it, uh, and he died of that. And so that is an issue that we've also dealt with. Of there was never any indication of anything wrong. And so the advice that we got was: you have to ask the question why. You have to ask it as many times as you need to, which may be for a long time. Eventually, you will arrive at the point of saying, I don't know, but I don't have to ask the question why anymore. OK. Um, this is from Mary Ann. I am divorced, and my 20 a uh, 29-year-old son died three years ago. I have two remaining uh, daughters, and we are close. How can I get past the loneliness that accompanies not having the relationship with my ex? We do speak, but avoid a lot of emotion surrounding his death. Hmm. I don't know that I've got a good answer for you. Um, this this would obviously there's grief. Um, when we step back and look at grief, it is, and we are so focused on the grief relating to the death of a, of our child or our children. Um, we need to sometimes expand our view to recognize what you're going through, which is the grief of the loss of this relationship with your ex. Uh, even though you uh, do, like you say, you do have some, uh, some conversation, but it doesn't reach any depth. And thinking about your ex's perspective, um, maybe that is just too painful and uh, can't go there. Uh, since you do have just, I mean, certainly this is an area that I would visit with a counselor about, but this is just the thought that comes to mind uh, for me is that maybe there would be an opportunity for um, visiting using a facilitator or someone else, not putting expectations on um, getting back together with your, with your ex, but um, pursuing the avenue of communication because this was our child that died and let's try to enhance our communication over this shared um, tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I think uh, Scott, we're near the top of the hour and it's um, time to wrap things up a little bit. Um, do you would you like to do that? Um, I certainly would. I, I uh, want to thank all of you for uh, being a part of this and, all, and for contributing your uh, questions and raising those issues, which give all of us some additional things to think about. I really hope that you've uh, looked at these uh, uh, designs that I've drawn, uh, and that you would then create those yourself and use those as you work through your grief journey and that is our hope that they will help you um, as you move along and reconcile yourself. Uh, you, you do not recover from this, but as you reconcile yourself and as you find a new day. Okay. Uh, thank you for being a part of it. Thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you, Scott. This, is, this has really been a terrific webinar.
Our webinars are recorded and posted on the Compassionate Friends website, www.compassionatefriends.org. Our next webinar will be on October 23rd when Dennis Apple, author of Life After the Death of My Son, What I'm Learning, will present a webinar on a father's grief. You can visit TCF on the Compassionate Friends website where you can find a local chapter and also links to our Facebook and Twitter pages. Good night, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Pat.